Tonight we're going to do our third and final message on our classic Christmas series. We've been looking at some movies and drawing out some godly points from it. And tonight we're going to look at the movie, It's a Charlie Brown Christmas. Yay! Yay. And this is, it's a really cool movie. This is the first color one that we're going to be watching. So, but to be sure, this is a classic movie. It's over 50 years old. It was, it, it was released in um, 1965, and um, it has aired on network TV every year since 1965, making it the longest-running cartoon ever. It's, uh, it's kind of ironic because the movie's about this um, young guy who's struggling with rejection, and the movie itself was rejected by all the networks when they first started to pitch it. And it could be because this movie has a, a really blatant gospel message, more blatant than all the other movies that we looked at. Um, Charles Schultz uh, was quoted as saying um, that he, was, he insisted on including the gospel message, otherwise why bother doing it? That, that was a quote from him. And when challenged about um, including scripture, because there's a whole passage of scripture that's read in it, and when he was challenged about that, his response was, um, if we don't do it, who will? So he clearly had a calling to bring the real meaning of Christmas to Christmas, right? So let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to use this little cartoon to, to move us closer to Jesus. Lord, thank you for Charles Schultz and ch thank you for the peanuts and the godly themes over the years that he's included. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and illuminate your word, your message to our hearts and to our minds through this message, through this cartoon. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to start with the opening scene of the cartoon, actually. So this opening scene sets the theme for the entire um, for the entire um, for the entire movie, and in it, Charlie Brown uh, makes two points in that scene right there. He makes the point of the search for meaning and the search for connection, and so that's that's our topic tonight: the search for meaning and connection. And uh, those two things sound like they're like it, they could be two messages. But as we'll see as we move through the message, they're actually inseparable. They're actually one topic, and we'll get to that. So starting with meaning. Charlie Brown feels, you can never just say Charlie or Mr. Brown. It's always Charlie Brown. And you notice all the, all the characters do that too. Whenever they talk to him, they say, Charlie Brown, you blah, 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 right? Um, he feels empty and discouraged uh, about Christmas, and he's searching for the real meaning of the season, right? Now, a little background. Charlie Brown is notoriously um, kind of introspective and even somewhat of a downer, okay? And not just about 
Christmas, but about life. That's his character. It was written into the comic strips before this and written into the subsequent movies. And just like in real life, um, Christmas, if it's real, if the Christmas story is real, then that affects everything, right? If this story is real, it's, it, it's about much more than a holiday. Now, humans are constantly trying to, sign, to assign meaning to just about everything, aren't we? Um, like, maybe when things go wrong, like your car breaks down and then, you know, the heater blow, burns out in your house or whatever, and, and what's our response usually? Why does this stuff have to happen, right? How many times have you heard people say that? How many times have you said that yourself? And when things are go going good, we say, what a blessing. It's always, we're always reading in meaning to things. And you know what? I believe firmly that God made us that way. He created us that way. Now we distort it and we don't use it right and, and everything like that all the time. But the truth is, we assign meaning to just about everything and I believe it's because God made us that way. Um, many years ago, as an illustration, when I owned my first home, um, the sewer kept backing up. After a couple years of living there, the sewer would back up in the basement. And it was significant because it was a really nice basement, you know, carpeted, you know, fixed up really nice, wood-burning stove. And every time that would happen, obviously it would stink really bad and it would ruin the carpet. You have to pull the carpet up. You have to... So this happened like three or four times. And this sent me into a bit of an existential crisis. I began to just really go, God, what is going on? Are you trying to teach me something? Or, or is this the devil trying to discourage me? Is it you or is it the devil? And I mean, I was writing about it. I was like long prayer times about it. In one of these prayer times, I felt like God just almost figuratively like just grabbed my face and went, Greg, I'm going to give you the meaning of this. Are you ready? And I'm like, yes, Lord, and I can take it, whatever it is. And he goes, Greg, it's hair and grease in your drain. <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh, okay. You know, I was trying to find some deep spiritual meaning about this pipe backing up. And... Really, it was hair and grease. It was that simple. I was applying the meaning wrongly. However, however, there actually was those other things happening. There's a paradox taking place. At the same time, this is 20-something years later, and I'm talking about it in a message. God did use it, and in other ways too. He used that event in a good way in my life. And you know what? The devil definitely used it to discourage us. He definitely used it in, in other ways to attack my family. Really. So there's this paradox happening. But we need to be careful how we um, assign meaning to things. We need to be purposeful. Um, now something that I've thought a lot about in life is the meaning of life. What is the meaning of life? Now, why did God create the universe? Why did he create the earth and all the beauty and the animals and the trees and the fish? Why did he do that? Now, I know not all of us spend a lot of time thinking about that, but I really believe that that's in all of us to ask those kind of questions, to think that way, right? And again, it's because God... He wired us that way. He wired us for meaning. Why? Why did God build that into us? This is really important. Because if you sincerely, openly, and honestly seek for the meaning of life, it leads us to Him. It leads us to God. Those questions all lead to God. What is the meaning of life? The meaning of life is love. 
It, it really is. That is why God created the universe. To love and to be loved. But what about the meaning of my life? Well, I can't answer that for you. I mean, each of us has to get the answer to that question from God. But to be sure, every life has meaning. Every life has meaning. And if we're not in touch with that, then we're lost. If we don't know the meaning of our lives, we're lost. And we receive that through the process of spiritual formation with God. We come to know our individual purpose in life by connecting with God. He begins to expand that and open our minds to it and show us. Now, look at Dr. Lucy. You remember her little booth, you know, the doctor is in? Dr. Lucy's um, prescription to Charlie Brown in his search for meaning. Actually, Lucy, my trouble is Christmas. I just don't understand it. Instead of feeling happy, I feel sort of let down. You need involvement. You need to get involved in some real Christmas project. How would you like to be the director of our Christmas play? Me? You want me to be the director of the Christmas play? Sure, Charlie Brown. We need a director. You need involvement. Hmm. You need involvement. So the doctor's prescription is purpose, meaning, do something. Do something for God. So Charlie Brown's normally like somber demeanor ignites. He just lights up. Did you see his eyes? He's like, you want me to be the director of the play? Right? Isn't that what happens to us when we find God's purpose for us? We just light up. We're energized by it. Now we've talked a lot in the last couple of weeks about our individual purpose in life, the meaning in life. So I'm not going to say anything more about that here. So we're made to search for meaning in the universe, right? And we're made to search for individual meaning. But we're also made for connection. We long for it. We seek it out like we do meaning. Charlie Brown did it just by looking for a Christmas card in his mailbox. Does anybody love me? Right? He's looking for connection in that. And the truth is, we literally can't live without connection. We can't. As infants, you will die if you don't have connection. Scientific fact. And in a recent study by Brigham Young University, um, they discovered that if we are socially isolated, we have a 32% more of a chance of dying. Our risk of death increases by 32% if we don't have connection, social interaction. Isn't that crazy? Lack of connection is worse for our health than smoking, than obesity, even worse than high blood pressure. These are studies that show that. Yet 25% of Americans say they have no connection in their life. 25% of Americans. That's 80 million people do not have connection in their life. Now, to put perspective on that, that's more than the population of California, New York, and Texas combined. That's how many people lack connection in the United States. And that's why we need the church. We need the church for meaning and for connection. Right? Who do you know? Who is in your circle of influence that's isolated, that needs us? Reach out to them. Invite them to renovate. If they don't live around here, challenge them, encourage them to plug in to a church somewhere and find meaningful, significant connection in their life. Now, connection can be both positive and negative. We've already seen a little bit of that, right? Let's look at 
an example of negative, negative connection. I had to leave the Snoopy laugh in there. I just love that. <laughs> um, so notice here that Charlie Brown says of the tree that it needs me. It needs a home, right? Charlie Brown was identifying with that little tree. It was a symbol of himself. Not desirable, not liked. Remember earlier in that first clip he says, I know nobody likes me. Well, through this, they're actually confirming that to him. And earlier, they change his name from a noun to a negative verb. They say, of all the Charlie Browns, you're the Charlie Browniest. <laughs> Poor guy. Those are examples of negative connection. And they don't bring life, do they? But listen to me, we cannot excuse ourselves from community because of stuff like that. We cannot withdraw from community. Scripture does not give us that option. We are to um, not stop gathering together as the church. It says that in Hebrews. And Charlie Brown related to that tree, but can't we all a little bit? I mean, don't we all go through seasons in life where um, we feel like we're not enough, like we're rejected, like people don't like us, maybe even despised? And the truth is we all deal with that in different ways. Some of us, we go, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become so good at something that everybody will have to like me, you know? I'm going to become an amazing guitar player like Mike. Then they'll have to like me. Or maybe they just become people pleasers and, you know, I'll just, I'll, do, I'll be a people pleaser. That'll make them like me. Or maybe you become a doormat so nobody gets mad at you and you just avoid everything, right? And then eventually we all go through seasons of actually hating ourselves. Think about it. We all experience that. And that's not good. People have the potential for incredible good. But they also have the potential um, for incredible evil. And this is kind of an example of it in community. Even with the downsides though, you guys, connection is better than no connection. And again, scripture doesn't give us an option. We are to connect. So how do we deal with that when it happens to us? Well, first of all, let's not do that to each other, okay? Let's not be those people. Let's love each other. But when it happens to you, how do we deal with it? Um, I want to illustrate that by another story. Uh, when I was just starting out in ministry, I had been in ministry maybe two or three years. I was part of this leadership team. Um, 
And I, I did not relate to the other guys on this team. They were all raised in affluent homes, um, well-spoken, you know, well-dressed. And they were into things that I just wasn't into, you know. So I was an outcast. I didn't fit in. And I remember a trigger is one of the guys who was like a golden boy, you know. He was like, he was the silver bullet. He was the star. He was going to become something great. Um, he came up to me and he put his hand on my head. Now he was like six seven. This this guy was huge, you know, like Tom's height or taller. And uh, he came up to me and he put his hand on my head and he said something really demeaning to me. Now I'm not going to tell you what I did to him because it was not a godly response, but. Um, the point is, is what it did to me, what that did to me. It really, it really hurt me. It really made me feel like an outcast even worse. But something amazing happened through that event, those events. Um, I began to press into God about that, about being rejected. And, and I offered that to him in worship. I just humbled myself. I, I tried really hard not to lash out. I wasn't successful, but I did try really hard not to, not to lash out. But, um, but I brought it to God in prayer. And something amazing happened that I struggled to articulate. I began to enjoy that feeling. I embraced the lowliness of it. And I turned that lowliness into Worship. And it transformed me. Now think about this. Scripture says of Jesus that he was despised and rejected. That he was held in low esteem. Jesus experienced that. But his up was what he drew from. Do you know what I mean by that? Remember the up, out, in? that we talked about, he got alone with the Father and was always brought back to center, right? Even as they were killing him, they were murdering him, and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, we need to learn to turn the other cheek. Whenever there is personal offense, we need to turn the other cheek. That's what that passage is talking about. Obviously, there are times when things are so unhealthy that we need to have boundaries and maybe even disconnect. But we should always overlook, turn the other cheek at personal offense. Jesus turned from some pretty serious insults, right? Now finally, Linus, he was kind of like the resident theologian of the Peanuts gang, right? Um, he brings this whole thing home. Um, he puts an end to the question, what is the meaning of Christmas? And what is the meaning of connection? Let's watch. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? I can tell you what Christmas is all about. And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night, and lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shall round about them. And they were sore afraid, and the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, to the Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. He shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in the manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's what Christmas is all about, try to run.
Charlie Brown is a blockhead, but he did get a nice tree. The herald angels sing, glory to the new. So Linus here is actually quoting from the Bible, Luke chapter 2. And he gives not only the meaning for Christmas, but of life itself, right? God so loved the world. That he sent his son, that whoever believes in him would have eternal life, right? That's meaning. That is the meaning. And he also answered the search for connection. So here he sees the little tree and he goes, it's not such a bad little tree. Maybe it just needs a little love, right? He sees the best in the tree. And he makes it beautiful again. Again, this is a symbol of Charlie Brown. It's a symbol of you and I in seasons of our life. And we need to see the best in people. Maybe we just need a little love. That's the positive side of connection. And to bring it home, Christmas. It's Christmas time, you guys. Does it feel like it? It's Christmas time. Do you know what Christmas is without Christ? It's just mass. <laughs> it's just mass. It's just stuff. A bunch of busyness and stress and stuff. Christmas without Jesus is empty and void. It's meaningless. And so is connection, empty and void, without God. Now, we need human connection. We looked at that. We can die without human connection. But we were created. We were made to connect with God. Without that, we're not doing what we made for. It will never feel right. Why do we often feel lost and depressed and lacking meaning and left out? Why do we often feel unfulfilled? It's because this world does not have the stuff that we're looking for. It's not here. Look at this quote from C.S. Lewis. I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy. The only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. <laughs> oh. If I don't find anything in this world that satisfies my desires, I must be made for another world. Nothing in this world can satisfy. Does that sound familiar? How many things have you sought satisfaction in? Think about it. A lot. All of us have done that. We seek for meaning. We seek for connection in so many other things than God. But we will never, ever fully find what we're looking for in this world. Now, there will be moments when the kingdom of heaven will break through this present evil age. And we will find significant meaning. We will find significant connection. Right? That's why Jesus said, pray that the kingdom would come and his will would be done. But we will never fully find that here. We'll never be satisfied. Be content to know that. And you know what? 
That's a really good thing. It's really good. Why? Why is that good? Because it points us to God. It, it causes us to turn to the only thing that can satisfy that, right? It reminds us this world is not our home. We're not made for this world. God wired us for meaning. Because when we seek meaning, what do we find? Him. We find Him. And He also wired us for connection, right? Because, and listen to this, because without connection, there can be no love. And love is the meaning of life. Do you see how those two are inseparable now? He made us for connection. And connection cannot happen. Or love, he made us for love. And love cannot happen without connection. And love is the meaning of life. God so loved you that he sent his son so that you can have eternal loving connection with him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And uh, so we allow that light to illuminate our lives and we adjust our course accordingly. We surrender to you, Lord. And we love you, Lord.